where to put the radioactive waste from U.S. nuclear power plants. There are more than 71,000 tons of nuclear waste stranded at the nation's 104 reactors. Put all those spent fuel rods together and you'd get a pile as big as a football field and more than 20 feet tall. U.S. regulators say the spent fuel rods can stay at power plants safely for decades. But after an earthquake and tsunami destroyed the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in Japan last spring, the 30-year push for a permanent storage site in the U.S. intensified. Some of that's political, but it's also because a lot of the radiation that escaped at Fukushima came from spent nuclear fuel rods stored there. That brings us to the debate over using Nevada's Yucca Mountain as this nation's nuclear dump site. It started during Ronald Reagan's presidency when the Department of Energy was looking for a permanent storage site big enough to hold about 77,000 tons of nuclear waste. Congress intervened and told DOE to consider only Yucca Mountain, a remote desert location about 90 miles outside Las Vegas. Opposition in Nevada delayed the process. Critics feared radioactive leaks, saying the mountain wasn't geologically sound, that it was too wet for long-term storage and too vulnerable to earthquakes. There was also concern that it would scare away tourists. It will never happen. Yucca Mountain will never come to be. President Barack Obama essentially killed the project when he cut off funding and set up a Blue Ribbon Commission to come up with a new plan. We need to accelerate our efforts to find ways of storing uh, this waste safely and disposing of it. The government has already spent $15 billion at Yucca drilling a five-mile-long tunnel. Most of that money came from ratepayers throughout the country. Now, with Yucca shut down, proponents are fighting back. As far as I'm concerned, Yucca Mountain is the repository. But Republican presidential candidates are singing a much different tune. The idea that 49 states can tell Nevada we want to give you our nuclear waste doesn't make a lot of sense. He's hit it the nail right on the head. Thousands of tons of waste from nuclear power plants. Who wants that in their backyard? I will set this nation on a course to building 45 new reactors by the year 2030. That's a promise voters he was speaking to in Nevada are wary of because of Congress's plans to store nuclear waste in their state, Yucca Mountain, something McCain has supported. I believe that Yucca Mountain is a suitable place for storage. Would you be comfortable with nuclear waste coming through Arizona on its way, you know, going through Phoenix on its way to uh, Yucca Mountain? No, I would not. We now know that 40% of the hazardous waste is combustible, thus posing a more serious and immediate threat. Organic waste, 3%, and, and so on. I think the combustible waste is perhaps the most significant because even a layman can understand that when combustible waste is exposed to high levels of heat, there may be some effect inside the true pack and not just from uh, the exposure to the heat on the outside. Wind is a critical factor which must be considered. The worst case scenario would be if a fire occurs within a breach of a container. The wind could then carry plutonium particles through the atmosphere, traveling considerable distances. As we learn more, acceptable doses of radiation become smaller. Currently, five REMS is allowed for workers in nuclear plants, equivalent to 1,000 X-rays on bone marrow. Well, I think you can say that most scientists uh, feel very strongly that uh, there is no uh, safe threshold for radiation. They go by what is called the linear no-threshold theory, that uh, doses, doses accumulate. The more dose you get, the, uh, the, more, the more health effects. The DOA claims people will not be exposed to harmful levels of radiation. The waste will be transported in specially designed TruePak containers. TruePak are surrounded by uh, three mini vaults, if you will, three uh, um, walls that are stainless steel, which includes uh, a 10-inch polyurethane hardcore foam that acts as a heat retardant and uh, energy absorber in case of impact. Um, and this outer layer basically protects that foam. The foam protects the inner layers inside. So you basically have many vaults within this true pack. Uh, this is a formation that does have... The container looks impressive, but it still needs to pass Nuclear Regulatory Commission testing. In one test, the container was dropped 30 feet onto a concrete slab. 
In this test, the outer shell sustained a puncture. The DOE claims such punctures will not endanger the contents. In a second test, the container sustained a further break. Some citizens feel that these tests are not difficult enough and do not reflect real-life scenarios. My concern about the true pack testing that I've read about is that in the true packs, as I understand it, has been some kind of powdered cement. Yet, in the latest DOE document, we find out there's going to be about 85% of the ha of the transuranic waste is going to be hazardous waste or mixed with hazardous waste, including combustible materials and various other materials that are listed as hazardous materials under federal law. And therefore, when they're exposing the true pack to fire, uh, intense levels of heat, to puncture tests, it would seem to me reasonable to at least simulate the kinds of waste that will be in there so that they have some validity to their tests. What are the possibilities of an accident occurring, and what kind? Well, there's been 173 radioactive accidents across the country. 34 of those have happened in New Mexico. We do have some rationale because we've been shipping this waste from Rocky Flats in Colorado up to Idaho for, you know, for a very long period of time, 25 years or more. And we have had accidents, but there has never been a release. And uh, there has never been a release of radiation from a Type B container. It may well be that uh, with all the transportation of all these uh, high-level waste and transuranic waste, we may be ending up with uh, Chernobyls uh, along the nuclear highways. <clears throat> because if there's any, ever any spill of plutonium uh, of a uh, significant degree, it'll be so devastating that it'll, it'll render large parts of this country uninhabitable. Um, these trucks are going into our city, right? and something happens. Who assumes responsibility for an accident? Well, your volunteer fire department or your fire department would respond. The state police are the ones that would take over the situation when they responded. One of my services would be first responder to a scene of an accident in, in, in this, at least in the city limits. Uh, it's to determine the, uh, whether or not there is any contamination as a, as a result and, and to attempt to form some initial opinion as to the uh, degree of that contamination. Carlsbad had recently upgraded their equipment with a hazmat truck. However, Tully said first responders would not necessarily have Geiger counters or even protective clothing. And the second concern was that they were telling, or at least uh, saying they were going to train the emergency preparedness people in the various communities along the whip route as to how to respond to an accident and I didn't understand how they could even begin to train these people if they weren't able to tell these people what kind of materials they were dealing with. We have placed it into the responsibility of our fire department and they are now pre preparing the plan for what we should and can do in the event that a, a, a spill might occur. Since this interview, the Santa Fe Fire Department received two official DOE first responder kits containing one plastic sheet, two paper suits, rubber gloves, one half-face respirator, and a roll of duct tape. I know we are not equipped. We have no equipment whatsoever to handle any accident uh, that might occur. But uh, I'm sure that if there is any, uh, any funds available for any special kind of equipment, then I'm sure that we will be asking for, for assistance in funding this. The whip trail is routed through major populated areas across the nation. In Congress, monies were promised for New Mexico bypasses and road improvements. No funds have yet been appropriated. One citizen has taken his concerns to one of the busiest intersections in New Mexico. I was overwhelmed with the support that I felt from uh, passing drivers uh, in the form of them honking their horns, in the, in the form of them shouting out the window, thank you for doing what you're doing. And I realized that in some way, we as a community at that moment had been bottled up and we hadn't, been, we hadn't had the opportunity for a long time to express our feelings about, about the people's input about WIP. All the generations which will ever live on Earth are here right now. So whatever, whatever we do to the genes, whatever we do to the, to the uh, sperm and over, of people will, be, will have its effect on future generations from now till forevermore.
At Hanford, Washington, another impossible project proved possible when a huge plant was built for the mass production of the artificial element plutonium. This process involves what may be called the furnace of atomic energy, the reactor pile. Well, the Department of Energy has recognized that B reactor is unique. It's the first full-size reactor in the world, the first one capable of producing anything. There was a test reactor in Chicago, and then the one-tenth scale reactor at Oak Ridge. They were too small to produce products. They proved the principles of operation, but they couldn't produce a product. So this is the first production reactor of any kind. the brains of the operation, that the action center, the, the physical muscular center of operation is in the front room, but this is the brains of the operation. This is what's behind the gauge. It's a little dial and it's set. And, and if the water pressure varied by more than 10 pounds per square inch, that meant there was some kind of a blockage in the tube the water wasn't getting through, and that was the worst possible scenario. So if this varied by more than 10 pounds, it would shut down the reactor. And every single one was capable of shutting down the entire reactor. So what was the water used for, exactly? The water cooled the uranium fuel. The reactor's fuel is metal uranium. During the nuclear reaction, it gets very hot gets up to the range of many thousands of degrees and you have to carry that heat away in the simplest way was simply to carry it off physically with cold water just a heat transfer system and that came from the Columbia River yes well a reactor doesn't generate anything like tank waste a reactor generates contaminated water and the water did flow into holding basins and then into the Columbia River. It did create some contamination. It did heat up the river very, very slightly. Um, and solid waste, uh, mechanical parts that failed, were buried in the soil near here. They have to be dug up. They have to be remediated. And so we are paying, um, still paying for the cost of operation today. Now the river has cleansed itself but we still have to deal with contaminated soil and groundwater. We're about to see Paul Venther. Paul was actually a worker who worked at Hanford during the 50s and up and through the 80s, and he's got a lot of stories he wants to share with us. Come along. So if someone comes to you, maybe on the street or somewhere else, and they say, hey, I don't know a lot about Hanford. Maybe I've lived here my whole life, but I don't know a lot. What, what do they need to know about Hanford? Well... It was developed at a time when the nation needed it. You had Hitler in Europe, who was threatening to dominate the world. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, and it was threatening also. I know a lot of people when I've been asked, how could you work with a toy to kill so many people, or this sort of thing. Well, it was a different time then. You were fighting for your life also here. In this big river, all the different kinds of fish come this way. And they go up these small rivers and now small creeks to generate or raise more fish. And that's what's important to us because it kept our people alive in the past. Can you tell me the importance of the Columbia River too? Uh, than as purse. Uh, yeah, the Columbia is the, the lifeblood. It's, it's, 
it's the waterway that provides that the all our other waterways and the tributaries in the northwest run into and flow out to the Pacific, which then you know the Pacific offers the salmon that come up the the river and, and is our our main nutrient behind water in a traditional sense. So here at Hanford, our the tribes the local tribes' mission is to to protect those resources as as we uh, near clean up and look at the future of the Hanford site, the long-term stewardship issues, and, and making sure that we plan effectively to uh, cohabitate the areas and co-utilize co uh, the resources out there, that we protect them for, for everyone, and, and that we we're respectful of our past as well as our future. You know, the challenges at Hanford are, are very complex, and are not going to take some time to fully understand what the effects of, of the contamination are and it would always be a challenge and there will always be barriers to, to how effective the cleanup can occur so our challenge as a tribe is to educate our youth and to get involved in, in this very tough arena that's not very uh, highlighted in, in the public eye. Uh, it goes back to a a town site that I think that was founded sometime in the 18, mid to late 1800s. It uh, uh, then was the name that was used to describe a, a large area of over 600 and some square miles that was set aside to produce plutonium as part of the Manhattan Project. So it really just describes an area here in central Washington that has uh, been used for many things. It was most recently it was a site of plutonium production. You know, it was a large, uh, very complex nuclear industrial facility with 50 miles of the Columbia River running through it. So what are the challenges associated with your job? Well, first, I mean, it's, a, it's an extremely large site. It's, it's spread out. The, the hydrodynamics of the site, uh, to dealing with the groundwater, are very complex in understanding those. Along with, we don't know where all of the waste sites are. We think we have a pretty good handle on it that can contaminate the groundwater. The waste sites were characterized, but not 100%, and we find surprises every day. We're dealing in a very hazardous environment, not only from chemicals and the nuclear part, the radiological part, but it is in the middle of a desert, and there's extreme temperatures, both cold and hot. We have the wind, a lot of the work is outdoors, so there's a lot of different elements that factor in, and uh, and the one thing we are committed to is to keep our people safe. Why is there so much tank waste on site? Well, plutonium production operations went on for a good number of years and is part of the process of separating the plutonium out. There was the waste that was generated and the decision was made to store that in underground tanks. So it's, there's a lot of waste generated and that's where it was stored. From the time of that first explosion until Hiroshima shuddered beneath the release of atomic energy, work on the bomb went steadily forward in closely guarded plants in New Mexico, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Hanford, Washington. So my understanding that your connection to Hanford is both professional and personal. Can you explain about that? Yeah, it's fortuitous. My mother is from Nagasaki, Japan and the material that was made for the plutonium that went into the atomic bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was produced here at Hanford back in the 1940s. I am in charge of the 53 million gallons of tank waste that's the legacy from the Cold War and we're in charge of retrieving, treating, and then immobilizing that tank waste eventually into glass for long-term storage. And the tri-party agreement um, is between three parties, the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Department of Energy, and then the State Department of Ecology. And it was established in 1989, so for the past 20 years, the tri-party agreement, or we call it the TPA. It does. Yeah, Washington Closure, Hanford manages the River Quarter Closure Project. It's a $2.1 million billion dollar project. It runs through 2015, September 2015. Our job is to tear down contaminated buildings and clean up contaminated waste sites that are located uh, along the Columbia River. 
what are what are some of the the challenges that we're seeing at Hanford right now? I think the biggest cleanup challenges at Hanford are the uh, 50 million gallons of highly radioactive uh, waste that's in the uh, 177 tanks at Hanford. And about a third of the uh, single shell tanks at Hanford, 70 or so, have leaked in the past. So getting that waste out of the tanks and treated is, is the biggest goal. With that, there's a lot of the most intensively used, most contaminated hand areas in Hanford are, are just perhaps 10 or 20 square miles. Well, overall our mission is, of course, to protect the environment. And what's the mission with respect to Hanford? Well, Hanford, we're here as part of the Tri-Party Agreement. Our role is regulatory oversight. In essence, the Department of Energy here is responsible for the cleanup, and we oversee it to make sure it's done in order to protect human health and the environment. The cleanup has actually been ongoing for 20 years now. It's very difficult about Hanford, it's just its size. You know, it's enormous. We have over 1,800 waste sites that need cleaned up. We have over 80 square miles of contaminated groundwater that's above um, drinking water standards. So one of the big issues when you have a, a cleanup that spans many decades it's just keeping focus because again it, it's with focus that we actually get projects completed. We will stop that, that contaminated water from entering the Columbia River within the next four to five years. It will be stopped um, and uh, I, I just feel that good progress is being made. There's an awful lot to do yet. There's years of it. Investigation Hanford's Dirty Secret. With all the uncertainties at Hanford, what's buried below this dirt was supposed to be the one slam dunk. 28 sturdy double shell tanks. If all else failed, at least these would protect the Columbia River, the food chain, and people from the worst of the worst on the planet. With two steel walls, not one, like the older tanks, the added safety barrier would contain that nuclear waste until scientists figured out a way to get rid of it for good. But that plan fell apart. The failure of a double shell tank is big, big news. The citizen watchdog group, Hanford Challenge, shocked the public last summer with information from a Hanford insider. The press release read, first double shell tank leaks at Hanford. A massive blow to the entire cleanup operation. And the reason is that uh, we are relying on these tanks to operate safely for 40, 50 years through the rest of the cleanup. Now the public wanted to know, what's going on? The board members and alternates, if you... Especially the 32 members of the Hanford Advisory Board, citizens, government officials, and scientists. Secondly, another suggestion is... It's their job to give sound advice to the feds and the state of Washington on how to solve problems at the site. But it seems like I'm getting quite mixed messages. The board had questions, and Tom Fletcher, a U.S. Department of Energy Hanford manager, was supposed to be the man with the answers. At a board meeting last September, Fletcher brought photos of mysterious material that had made its way into that safety space between the two walls of the tank known as AY-102. But Fletcher told the policy advisors he didn't know what it was yet. They were saying, well, don't jump to conclusions, it's just a possible leak. Meredith Crafton and Tom Carpenter of Hanford Challenge both attended the September meeting. The overall um, presentation was, was, we're looking, but we don't see any evidence yet. Don't worry. Don't worry. Representative Jerry Paulette was there as well. And their answer was, we're investigating it, but we think that it's likely that it's rainwater. Here's an audio recording of a portion of Fletcher's presentation. It could be a carbonate buildup. Yes. Uh, and, and that's what, and that's, that's a possibility. It's just, like I said, we've, we've seen a lot of different things, and they just don't point to any one thing, and that's why I'm really hard to speculate what it is. We haven't got to a point that says, hey, we know what it is. We have know there is a, a history of what rainwater leakage in this tank annulus we found those explanations don't add up a month before that meeting with all the speculation of rainwater a tiny piece of duct tape something similar to this told a different story this is duct tape employees from the government contractor in charge of the tanks wrps lowered into the safety space of ay 102 to grab a sample of whatever was down there and boy did that tape deliver Internal emails obtained by King 5 show that on August 13th, weeks before the board briefing, the lab reported to company execs what they'd found. Flakes of rust, old paint, and something else. Some of the most dangerous nuclear byproducts known to man, strontium-90, plutonium, cesium-137, and more. The exact components of AY-102's primary tank. After they analyzed the duct tape, should there have been a lingering question is the tank leaking? 
or not. Via Skype, we shared the findings with our radiation expert, Marco Kaltofen of Boston. I don't know what they're waiting for. Did they need a fax from the president saying, okay, this is a leak? It was time. All the information was there to make the right decision. And that was on that tape? Absolutely. The tape held one more important clue. It was screaming hot with radioactivity. And remember, the sample came from the safety space that shouldn't record any contamination at all. That's a huge number. You actually have to go out and look hard for equipment that can measure radiation that's that high. You had all the information you needed, you knew you had a leak, and now it was just time to, to fess up, face the music. We wanted to ask WRPS President Mike Johnson about that and more. He repeatedly denied a request for an on-camera interview. Hi, Mr. Johnson. I'm Susanna Frame from King TV. We talked on the phone before. We're here to talk about Tank AY-102. Can you tell us why the public was misled for several months last year? We caught up with Johnson outside the WRPS offices in Richland. I think we have some important questions that our viewers deserve to have answered. Johnson didn't answer our questions, but members of the Handred Advisory Board did when we told them about the tape and lab results dated in August, a month before their briefing. If they're going to say, it just dismiss the evidence, the obvious evidence in front of them and not even tell us about that evidence, uh, then how can we rely on them for anything? And I think it can put the public at risk and workers at risk when they're not forthcoming with information, also meaning they're not forthcoming with responding to issues and respond in creating solutions. This was a very deliberate cover-up and I will use the word that we were lied to. There's no two ways about it. We were lied to. And it wasn't just WRPS President Mike Johnson who wouldn't answer our questions about this issue. The Department of Energy, which put on the presentation for that advisory board, they wouldn't answer any questions about the tape, the lab results, and the delay in telling the public what was really going on there. How much for how long? Governor Inslee wants answers about a radioactive leak at Hanford. They are the strongest words yet from the new governor and the strongest in years directed at the Department of Energy and contractors at the nuclear reservation. King 5 environmental specialist Gary Chittum is live in Richland where the heat has been turned up and turned up big time. Gary. Lori and Dennis, you can feel the heat all the way from Olympia right now. First of all, though, let's make very clear that the Department of Energy and the state say there is no risk to human health because of what is happening inside here. However, the governor made it very clear today he is upset. He's not going to tolerate what's happening right here. He directed his message directly to the Department of Energy. He is unhappy that there's a tank with a half a million gallons of highly toxic radioactive materials leaking in Hanford. Hanford Tea Farm. No activity could be seen in the nuclear waste farm today above ground, but an apparent underground leak set off a reaction today in Olympia. There's some suggestion that this leak has been going on for years rather than weeks. Suspected leaks at Hanford are nothing new. Over the last 70 years, there have been as many as 69 of them. Tank T-111 was first deemed a possible leaker in the 1970s and has been heavily monitored since then. Contractors say they noticed a drop in the level of the underground tank that indicates a loss at a rate of up to 300 gallons a year. That heavily radioactive material can, and has in other cases, migrated to the groundwater below. That presents a clear threat to the nearby Columbia River, which tank farm officials say so far has not happened, even though there have been so many suspected leaks. The fact that uh, you know, we've experienced leaks before should not, in my view, be any excuse or license to get out of jail for the federal government given the depth of this responsibility. T-111 is a first generation tank built in the mid-1940s and it holds seriously radioactive leftovers from the production of World War II bombs. It was never designed nor expected to hold up this long. Hanford and contractors have spent years trying to stabilize and transfer the waste to newer but still aging double-walled tanks. This presents a new risk. And that risk is, if T-111, a long-time suspected leaker and re-leaker, and a heavily monitored tank, could be leaking this badly, and perhaps for a very long time, how many others could be at risk? The DOE issued a statement indicating there does not appear to be any obvious signs of contamination around the tank. Monitoring wells in the T-Tank farm, where tank T-111 is located, have not identified significant changes in concentrations of chemicals, or radionuclides in the soil. 
Okay, well, some equipment doesn't seem to be working properly because one set of equipment is saying that the level is dropping in the tank. The others are saying there's no contamination under or near the tank. It's had to go somewhere. That's what they're going to try out, and it's a very frustrating very frustrating ordeal to try to get to the bottom of it. Lori and Dennis? Gary, how will they know if other tanks are leaking? That, again, is going to be a very complex situation. They have it wired right now, and they've been doing a good job of monitoring this situation, but obviously this calls into play. Maybe they're going to have to go in and then go in one by one and inspect them all, and that will slow down an already bogged down cleanup process here. All right. Gary Chittum live in Richland. Thank you. Environmental watchdog groups applaud the governor's tough stance, but they want more. They want action now before the situation gets worse. King 5's Natalie Swaby is live with a reaction to today's announcement. Natalie. Well, the executive director of Hanford Challenge, a group with a mission to protect the environment and the public's health, says there's a need now for new double-shell tanks to be built to store waste from confirmed leaking tanks. That's just one of the things we discussed after the news broke. We've got 177 tanks. Tom Carpenter has spent three decades charting Hanford's troubles. Here's the river. The river goes down to the ocean. We're connected to the ocean. So Hanford's radiation has ended up in the ocean and has washed up on Seattle shores in the past. From his Seattle office, he pumps out the press releases. We work with whistleblowers out there. Uh, we go to all the public meetings. We look at the environmental issues. Um, you know, so we, we pay very, very close attention to what's going on at Hanford night and day. And today, he's working overtime after this announcement from Governor Jay Inslee. There is newly leaking single-shell tanks at the Hanford site. It spotlights again the mess we're in at the Hanford site. This is the worst contaminated facility in the United States. The new report highlights an old problem, leaking tanks. Oh, if this were 300 gallons a year at City Hall, it would be a huge deal. This is a lot of nuclear waste. We're talking waste that's dangerous in microscopic quantities, very, very tiny amounts. Carpenter wants action now. Under the law, this tank needs to be pumped and emptied to protect the groundwater. His watchdog group is anxiously waiting to see Hamford's next move. An alarming discovery at our state's lone nuclear site. Leaking single-shell tanks at the Hanford site. And tonight, concerned not only about what we know, but what we don't. The public really deserves to know exactly what's happening. From lawmakers to public interest advocates to the governor himself, the calls for action are ringing loud and clear. The big questions tonight, what happens next at Hanford and what kind of long-term impact could this toxic leak have? Come for us, John Humbert has been gathering a reaction to the story for us tonight. He's live in the Satellite Center with what he's learned. John? Well, good evening tonight, guys. Pol uh, people, rather, that we spoke to tonight say that they've had a lot of concerns for years and now it's setting the stage for a showdown between Washington State and Washington, D.C. I, I got to tell you, you couldn't find a more perfect radioactive storm. Governor Jay Inslee took the feds to task for the hundreds of gallons of radioactive sludge leaking at the Hanford nuclear facility. And the fact that, uh, you know, we've experienced leaks before should not, in my view, be any excuse or license to get out of jail for the federal government. The federal government says there is no immediate threat to people from the leaking tank, and experts say the sludge may not make it to the Columbia River. That's little comfort for longtime critics. And this isn't the only issue at Hanford where we've got the potential for literally a catastrophic event happening. Jerry Paulette is an environmentalist with Heart of America Northwest. He's also a state representative. He's calling for more regulation and possibly new laws to contain Hanford's 177 tanks for action by the federal government. We need to have the planning underway for new tanks. Others are concerned the leaks are signs of trouble to come. You can't take it back. Once the radioactive waste is there, it's there. From 1986, legislators call for session on nuclear dump. Michaela Preskill with Wash Perg says that years of initiatives and public outcry still haven't stopped environmental damage. We anticipated it. She says this is a wake-up call. Um, you know, we've yet to see that we can store nuclear waste safely and properly. As for Paulette, he's going to keep pushing the state to apply pressure on Washington, D.C. He says too much is at risk, and there are still too many questions. We don't know what will happen here. Governor Inslee made it very clear that the federal government needs to step up and fully explain what happened and also how to fix it. 
He's willing to go to court to get that done. There's also little progress in D.C. for budgeting for this cleanup. That could also hamper any solution at all. Live in the Satellite Center, John. Let's talk about what nuclear waste does to the environment. On Friday, Washington State government officials announced just how much toxic waste has made its way into the Columbia River's subterranean basin from a nuclear site in southern Washington. The radioactive soup is leaking from six underground tanks at the Hanford Nuclear Facility, which has been regarded as the most contaminated site in the entire country. It was developed as a nuclear weapons production facility in 1943 as part of the Manhattan Project and has since held millions of liters of radioactive leftovers. This nuclear sludge is held in storage tanks that have long ago reached their 20-year lifespans. Yeah, you heard me right. These tanks that hold radioactive waste expire in just 20 years. So, not only is nuclear material being kept in containers that eventually deteriorate, but leakage from the containers has been recorded at the site since the 60s. Since then, nearly 200 of these toxic bins have already failed. According to Washington state officials, the leaks produce between 150 to 300 gallons every year, meaning that thousands of tons of nuclear sewage have already been contaminating the environment at the site for decades. Now, if you're feeling outraged about the criminal negligence allowing one of the most beautiful states in the country to have been poisoned for the last half century, you should be. But you might want to hold on to that anger because it's about to get worse. Finally, state and federal officials agree that a cleanup at the site must be made. One small problem, though. Nuclear waste doesn't really go away. No matter how much money you throw at the problem, it's there to stay for centuries. A new report by the Department of Energy sets the lowest estimates of the cleanup at $115 billion and is expected to last until 2090. And, of course, the bill is for you and me the taxpayers to front, but it always falls in the backs of the people, doesn't it? Even the location of these sites are designed to take advantage of the most vulnerable. The Hanford site was constructed in a sparsely populated mountain region. Other than the 250,000 residents that are just downstream from the nuclear site, there are also at least six Native American reservations that are adversely affected. Hanford is just another example of what journalist Chris Hedges refers to as one of capitalism's sacrifice zones, which he describes as, quote, areas that have been destroyed for quarterly profit. And we're talking about environmentally destroyed, communities destroyed, human beings destroyed, families destroyed. And because there are no impediments left, these sacrifice zones are just going to continue to spread outward. The idea here is just like human beings as human beings, just like the natural resources of our planet, have become commodities to be exploited and abused, the end result of which is collapse. And in the current trajectory, this is unavoidable. This exploitation is the byproduct of predatory capitalism. You just have to look at the most impoverished areas of the country where natural resources abound and political influence is most scarce. Places like the coal mines of Appalachia where the profits made on the backs of the laborers fill the pockets of the rich coal barons who live far from the contaminated soils, degraded waters, and polluted air. Look, the damage that Hanford leaks have caused is irreparable, but the remaining threat posed as we move forward is far worse. These sacrifice zones may seem far away from what you and I know now, but what would you do if this was in your backyard? Because soon it might be. If we don't halt the gears of this machine, we become the gears for the machine. In a corner of the Saitama sewage treatment plant, workers take us for a look at a danger they never thought they'd have to deal with. Underneath the tarps wrapped in layers of waterproof sheeting are tons of radioactive sewage. Saitama is hundreds of kilometers away from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant. Still, in May, alarming levels of radioactive cesium were detected in the sewage sludge. Workers said the government asked the plant's employees to store the waste, but none of them have any training in how to handle the hazardous material. We're trying to study how the radiation will affect us, but we can't understand everything. That's all we can do to cope. Treated sewage used to be passed on to cement and fertilizer companies. 
With it now radioactive, no one wants to take it. In a hallway, the piles stretch for one kilometer. When we run out of space, then we just have to stop the operation entirely. We're already in an emergency situation, but if that happens, we're in serious trouble. There are more than a dozen sewage plants in Japan facing the same situation. Still, months after the nuclear disaster, the government has no policy on what to do with the waste. Al Jazeera requested an interview, but a government spokesman refused, saying the radioactive sewage is not an immediate danger. The government has told the public and the staff working in these facilities that the radiation threat is minimal and that the air quality is safe. However, we've been walking up and down this corridor just a few minutes and our Geiger counter has already gone off several times. Currently, it's reading 0 .60, 0 0.61. Soil expert Sozo Suzuki says in a healthy environment, radiation levels should barely register. This is a disaster affecting all residents in Japan. The level of danger is not that adults and children will die tomorrow, but in five to ten years' time, cancer or illness will show. We know that from Chernobyl. The government is allowing low-level radioactive sewage to be turned into fertilizer, despite warnings from experts that it will affect food in Japan. Worries over contamination have led some farmers to spend more on high-end fertilizers, free of sewage. We check the fertilizers for radiation and also where they come from. It's how we can be sure it's safe. Back at Saitama, workers have been asked to stay away from the waste when not working on it. The more cesium there is, the more the radioactivity increases. And the worry now is whether the growing piles could soon affect the people living around the plant. Steve Chow, Al Jazeera, Saitama, Japan. A study is underway at this research institute operated by the European Union. Beyond a one meter thick piece of glass, spent nuclear fuel is being extracted from a reactor. It contains highly radioactive materials such as plutonium. If you would enter the cells, the activity of the spent fuel handle in the cells is of the order of a few sieverts. In the worst case, this dose could cause very serious harm to health and, and even cause uh, death. Spent fuel is an unavoidable byproduct of nuclear power generation. The risks it presents became clear after the March 2011 accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant operated by Tokyo Electric Power Company or TEPCO. Even as some of the reactors there were melting down, another crisis was in the offing. Nuclear fuel was stored next to each reactor in a storage pool. The cooling system in the pool stopped working and water levels started to go down. In the worst case scenario, a meltdown could have occurred in the pools too. The Fukushima accident has made it evident that spent nuclear fuel should not be stored above reactors. It's been about two years since the accident. Nuclear power plants across the country still store huge amounts of spent fuel. No one has found a way to deal with the spent fuel, nor have sites been found for its final disposal. The spent fuel kept piling up. It now amounts to 17,000 tons for Japan as a whole. Some nuclear plants could run out of storage space in about two years if they were to go back online. What can be done about this nuclear waste, which has nowhere to go? A nuclear energy policy that once neglected waste management is now sending ripples across the nation. That's nonsense. If you think you can solve the problem by bringing waste to Almori and leaving it here, you're mistaken. 
The disposal of spent nuclear fuel and radioactive waste must be part of all future discussions of nuclear power plants. We'll explore several paths to resolving this critical issue. It's now been two years since the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Before the incident, I didn't know such large amounts of spent nuclear fuel were stored at power stations. The sight of self-defense forces, personnel and firefighters trying to spray water to cool down the spent fuel made me realize how dangerous it is. I remember being scared, too. We can no longer ignore the challenge of ensuring the safety of existing stockpiles of spent nuclear fuel and disposing of radioactive waste. In this program, we'll examine the issue with Yoshihiro Nemoto. He's a senior NHK reporter specializing in science and culture. Mr. Nemoto, why do power plants have all that dangerous spent fuel in the first place? Japan considers spent nuclear fuel to be a resource, not waste. The country's basic policy is to store spent fuel at nuclear power plants to await reprocessing. But things are not going as planned. Let me explain. The idea was to transfer spent fuel from nuclear power plants across Japan to a reprocessing plant in Rokasho village in Aomori prefecture in northern Japan. There it would be separated into reusable nuclear material and nuclear waste. The waste would then be disposed of. That was the plan when the country opened its first nuclear power plants. But I understand the final disposal site hasn't been selected yet. That's right. There aren't even candidate locations to choose from. What's more, the reprocessing plant has never been fully operational either. So the huge amounts of spent fuel have nowhere to go. And that's why they're still sitting at nuclear power plants across Japan. It's been half a century since the country started generating nuclear power. Why haven't matters progressed? Ever since Japan built its first nuclear plant, the parties involved have known there would be nuclear waste. But the government and the power companies were busy trying to bring plants online. They avoided facing the issue of nuclear waste head on. They just left it on the back burner. After Fukushima, the dangers of spent nuclear fuel suddenly surfaced. Let's now take a look at the hazards of keeping spent fuel in storage pools and examine why the biggest challenge, disposing of nuclear waste, is not being adequately addressed. Reactor number four of the Fukushima Daiichi plant was opened to the media for the first time in May 2012. An explosion had blown away the roof of the reactor building, exposing the pool where spent nuclear fuel was stored. After it's removed from a reactor, spent fuel continues to release massive amounts of heat for several years. The spent fuel needs to be stored in water to cool it down. Reactor number four storage pool contained 250 tons of spent nuclear fuel. The plant lost power right after the accident. Cooling water could no longer circulate in the pools. The helicopter has just dropped some water. Frantic efforts helped contain the situation but a delay in cooling the spent fuel could have caused a meltdown. Major damage to reactor number four storage pool could lead to the worst case scenario. We figured the government should be prepared for it. Here's the worst case scenario the government drew up at the time. On the sixth day following the accident, 
the water level in reactor number four's storage pool goes down. The spent nuclear fuel gets exposed and starts spewing radioactive materials. On day 14, the water evaporates completely, causing a meltdown. The spent fuel releases huge amounts of radioactive substances because it's not protected like the fuel in a reactor's containment vessel. Contamination would spread over a 250 kilometer radius area around the Fukushima Daiichi plant, forcing everyone living there to evacuate. Spent fuel keeps piling up at nuclear power plants. There's simply no place else for it to go. Researchers in the northernmost prefecture of Hokkaido are trying to solve the problem. How should nuclear waste be disposed of? A government plan calls for burying the waste over 300 meters underground. That's to prevent above-ground hazards. Spent nuclear fuel produces liquid waste when it's reprocessed. The liquid emits extremely strong radiation. Even brief exposure to it could be lethal. The liquid can be turned into a solid by mixing it with glass. The process is known as vitrification, but it would still take tens of thousands of years to become harmless. Here's an idea for a final disposal site. Nuclear waste would be buried in a network of underground tunnels. With an area of some 10 square kilometers, the site would house 40,000 blocks of vitrified nuclear waste to be generated by about 2020. This is just a research facility. No nuclear waste would be brought here. Scientists are studying groundwater flow and the strength of the surrounding rock. But it's difficult to accurately predict what conditions will be like tens of thousands of years from now. Well, we're still dealing with nature even though we're under the Earth's surface. We need to minimize uncertainty as much as possible, and that's what we're trying to do. Finding a final disposal site is the job of the Nuclear Waste Management Organization of Japan, or NUMO. It was jointly established by the government and power companies. Concern over the country's growing nuclear waste problem led the group to launch NUMO in 2000. That was 34 years after Japan's first nuclear plant went online. NUMO decided to wait for municipalities to apply to be candidate locations. Prospective host localities, Prospective host localities will go through three stages of investigation before construction can begin. Candidates receive financial incentives at each stage. A maximum of 2 billion yen will be awarded in the first stage and 7 billion yen in the next stage. But there has not been a single application so far. And the Fukushima accident has made it even more difficult to find candidate sites. Some experts have expressed concern about burying nuclear waste in a seismically active country like Japan. But it's also true that there are no other viable options. Finding a disposal site should be the top priority. What's the situation in other nations with nuclear power plants? Let me show you a map. There are 31 countries and territories with nuclear power plants. Only two of them have identified disposal sites, Finland and Sweden. As you can see, most countries are facing difficulties. How are they tackling the issue? 
Let's take a look at two European countries. The UK is having trouble finding a disposal site, and Switzerland is taking a different approach from Japan. Cumbria County in central England started talks with the central government five years ago about hosting a nuclear disposal site in exchange for economic rewards. Twenty years ago, the government had considered building a disposal site in the county. NIREX were conducting excavations of, of boreholes. Cumbria was already home to a nuclear facility. The government conducted research secretly without telling residents. But once the news came out, strong local But once the news came out, strong local opposition derailed the plan. They didn't involve uh, themselves with for instance, the local parish councils to uh, acquaint the, uh, these councils with what was going on. People couldn't quite understand what was taking place and why they weren't being consulted. Government officials learned a lesson from that experience. And in 2008, they completely changed their approach. The focal point of their new strategy was a discussion forum called Partnership. This partnership meeting was held in Cumbria County. Government representatives would listen to the residents' opinions and answer all their questions. An employee of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority explained in detail the risks of hosting a disposal site. Obviously people are concerned about radioactivity escaping from the facility. And the answer to all of those is yes, they all could happen. An attempt to show that for all of those scenarios, certainly the more likely ones, there is an acceptable outcome in terms of the hazard presented to the environment and to people. They quite rightly will want to seek their own inputs and their own advice and their own views on things. That takes time. We need to make sure that they're properly resourced so that they can do that. That's good news and bad news as information comes forward um, is important and that will certainly help build up trust. They studied, the issues for five years. they studied the issues for five years. Then it was time to make a decision. In January, the council reached a conclusion. The vote was three in favor versus seven opposed. Local fear over the suitability of the local geology was the determining factor. Very good work that the West Cumbria Partnership did, that the level of trust was improving, but clearly had further to go. But I think it's a shame, but uh, it's their right to make that decision, and, and they've made it, and now we need, need to move forward. In Switzerland, the government selects possible sites before consulting the municipalities concerned. This is a world-renowned center for research into nuclear waste disposal. It's run by the National Cooperative for the Disposal of Radioactive Waste, or NAGRA. The government has identified possible sites based on NAGRA surveys. Three northern areas are selected as they seldom have earthquakes and the effects on groundwater would be limited. The areas are located about 50 kilometers from Zurich. The government has the responsibility to construct a nuclear waste disposal site. 
Gibt es eigentlich it must present the facts and show people which areas of the country would be the safest. But the fact that the government chose the sites sparked opposition. You say that our area was selected just based on surveys, but I'm not convinced. We are making our proposals based on scientific analysis. The Swiss government will withhold plans to promote the local economy until the residents decide to accept the site. The government doesn't want the money to influence the residents' decision. The government thinks it's vital that the residents be persuaded by the science. In the future, local governments and residents may seek financial benefits. But it's not a good idea to try to solve the problem only with money. We'll lose their trust if we do that. Martin Otto runs a dairy farm close to the proposed disposal site. He went to the meeting to represent his community. At first, he was opposed to the site. He was fearful of the possible effects. But the nuclear accident at Fukushima changed his view. He realized that nuclear waste must be disposed of as soon as possible. Someone has to accept it. No, we've learned from Fukushima. We're more aware and feel a responsibility to do something. Now we think that our job. How can spent fuel be stored safely until a disposal site is found? Switzerland uses a method called dry cask storage. Spent nuclear fuel is cooled, then placed in steel casks and stored. The spent fuel is completely sealed inside. This method is said to be safer than keeping it in a pool. The facility will not pose a big threat, even if the power goes out. The container completely shuts in radiation, and electricity is not needed. Switzerland plans to store spent fuel here for 40 years, until a final disposal site is built. No one can assure 100% safety for tens of thousands of years. What is most important is to be very clear when explaining to the public that we are taking every precaution and we're doing our best to make sure it's safe. It's not only Japan that's looking for the best way, is it? Both countries have been making every effort to construct a disposal site. Sometimes they're able to move forward and sometimes not. Many countries, including Japan, think it could be another 30 years before they can get their sites up and running. 30 years from now? We need time to get local consent and build the site. There's no time to lose. A solution seems a long way off, but the dry cask storage method used in Switzerland seems safer than the pool storage method used in Japan. 
そうですね。It doesn't need power to keep things cool, so it is safer. As a matter of fact, dry storage is already used in some of Japan's nuclear power plants. This year, a major facility will be completed in Mutsu, Aomori Prefecture. Oh, I see. But Japanese regulations require that all spent fuel be reprocessed, so we can't dispose of it as waste like they do in Switzerland. This is one of the factors that are holding back the disposal of radioactive waste in Japan. Let's look at the map again. The reprocessing plant in Rokasho village in Aomori encountered many problems and has not yet started full-scale operation. Consequently, spent fuel is piling up in nuclear power plants around the nation. Even if a site is constructed, the rules prohibit disposal without reprocessing. That's why the disposal of spent fuel is still at a standstill. Maybe we should give up reprocessing altogether. As a matter of fact, that's a pretty common opinion. In the discussions after the Fukushima accident, that was one of the options raised. To forget about reprocessing and dispose of spent nuclear fuel as waste. However, the decision was made to continue the policy and finish building the reprocessing plant. It is scheduled to be completed in October this year. Why was the decision made to continue? Our investigation revealed that narrow self-interest was the reason. Some parties feared that the operation of nuclear power plants and their businesses would be affected if reprocessing were to be abandoned. Picture. Japan Nuclear Fuel Limited runs the facility, which was established jointly by Japan's power companies. It was supposed to start operating in 1997. Spent nuclear fuel would be collected from all over Japan and separated into fuel and radioactive waste, a vital part of the recycling process. The extracted fuel would be multiplied in a fast breeder reactor and recycled repeatedly. It was to be the dream nuclear fuel cycle that would provide unlimited power to resource poor Japan. But the development of the Monju fast breeder reactor was halted after an accident in 1995. The reactor may never be operational. As for the reprocessing plant at Rokasho, completion was delayed 19 times due to repeated problems. Although the ideal nuclear fuel cycle has not been realized, the cost of reprocessing is already reflected in every household's electricity bills. The plan was reaching a dead end. So why didn't the government abandon the idea of the nuclear fuel cycle? NHK has learned that some officials at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry proposed stopping the plan nine years ago. These junior officials spelled out their reasons in a proposal called Why We Should Close the Rokasho Plant. The policy has lost its significance. We can't deceive the public anymore. We can't deceive the public anymore. The ministry was promoting the project. Why did these officials go against ministry policy? An official who had been engaged in creating Japan's energy policy granted us an interview. The key issue was the huge reprocessing costs. The key issue was the huge reprocessing costs that ratepayers would have to bear. 
some people estimated the plant would cost 11 trillion yen to run in the 40 years following the start of operations. We knew the fast breeder reactor would not be completed. It was economically and politically meaningless to continue. And we were disgusted by the idea of pouring trillions of yen into something that was worthless. JNFL was established jointly by power companies. Some people within TEPCO, its major shareholder, started questioning the project. Interviews with TEPCO officials revealed that the company considered the project a business risk because of its unpredictable future. The nuclear fuel cycle may be a dream technology for engineers, but it has no benefits for power companies. Yes, they discussed the pros and cons of reprocessing. Yes, they discussed the pros and cons of reprocessing. Deregulation of the power industry was ongoing. We had the lower costs, and Rokasha was too costly. Then why did the government and power companies continue the project? Spent fuel from many different areas had already been sent to the reprocessing plant to be recycled. If the project were halted, the spent fuel would be considered radioactive waste and not recyclable fuel. And the Aomori government was entitled to send back the spent fuel if that happened. The power plants would be overwhelmed with returned nuclear, the power plants would be overwhelmed with returned nuclear fuel. They'd be forced to suspend operations. We learned this from a former TEPCO director. We learned this from a former TEPCO director. Nuclear power plants won't be able to operate if reprocessing. Nuclear power plants won't be able to operate if reprocessing is abandoned. As far as they're concerned, reprocessing is a matter of life or death. Talks were held between the government and power companies. Both sides agreed to place a priority on continuing the nuclear power program, regardless of reprocessing costs. The expensive reprocessing plan survived. The power companies and the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry failed to agree on a framework to eliminate the huge financial burden they placed on the public. We couldn't face the fact that we'd created such an expensive white elephant. Then, the issue resurfaced after the nuclear accident at Fukushima. Last year, the government led a study to review the reprocessing project. Governor Mimura issued a vigorous protest. We're worried that the spent fuel will remain in Aomori. This is not what we agreed on. If it's not going to be reprocessed, it must be returned. Aomori is not a dumping ground for nuclear waste. The government decided not to change its policy. In the background were the conflicting interests of the parties involved. obtained recordings of what was said. The 
Atomic Energy Commission held 23 closed meetings after the Fukushima accident. Even as the government reviewed the policy, JNFL, TEPCO, the Cabinet Office, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, and the Atomic Energy Commission were meeting to discuss the issue. You have to run the reprocessing plant, right? Mm, thanks for your understanding. Well then, that's it. We can't work out a plan to shut down Rokasho. JNFL handed out this material at the meeting. The firm had accumulated one trillion yen in debt. The firm had accumulated one trillion yen in debt. Company officials stressed that if the reprocessing program were stopped, they would no longer be able to borrow money and could face a financial crisis. A private firm can't withstand such a crisis. We need some sort of assistance. We'll need around 300 billion yen a year. If we were a government-owned entity, we could stop reprocessing right away. Exactly. Private companies get into trouble if the money stops flowing. You mean the banks will stop lending? Closing Rokosho means everything will stop. So please prevent that from happening somehow. We asked JNFL about the meeting. This is an outline of their response. This is an outline of their response. JNFL was established as a private company and has been preparing to start up the reprocessing plant based on national policy. If this policy suddenly changes, we'll need to take steps. We were explaining the facts from a commonly accepted perspective. Generally speaking, stopping the project will have negative financial effects on both municipalities and electric companies. The Atomic Energy Commission's Vice Chairman, Tatsujiro Suzuki, attended the meeting. He agreed to an interview. He said the Commission must be neutral and acknowledged that a closed meeting should not have been held. He explained why the reprocessing program will not He explained why the reprocessing program will not be changed. Invested interests are the main concern. Many businesses are counting on a successful outcome for the planned nuclear fuel cycle. They don't want to see any changes that could affect their business. Suzuki feels it will be difficult to talk about changes with things as they are now. We should first discuss the policy. We should first discuss the policy and decide on a feasible solution, and then think about Rokasho. The country's 50-year-old nuclear energy policy, systems and organizations are standing in the way of change. The situation limits what we can do. Even though many people realize that reprocessing won't work, the project continues. The reprocessing program was supposed to give resource-poor Japan an unlimited supply of energy. But as time passed, it became simply a tool to keep nuclear power plants running and protect the businesses involved. 
Other factors influenced the decision as well. These included possible harm to the local economy and potential damage to relations with the United States, which is worried about a decline in Japanese technology. But changing the current framework is the only way to move forward. The Fukushima disaster opened our eyes. Now that we know the dangers of radioactive wastes, we can't keep putting the problem off for future generations to solve. That's right. We've been soft on ourselves. The parties involved said it takes time. So the government and communities forgave them for failing for more than 10 years to make progress toward finding places to dispose of waste. But we can't allow this to go on. It's been two years since the Fukushima accident. The government has decided to allow Japan's nuclear power plants to restart once their safety is confirmed. But is that enough? More operating plants means more spent fuel and more nuclear waste to be disposed of. Plant safety is vital, of course. But we also need to find safe ways to deal with radioactive waste. Only when both issues are resolved can we start talking about restarting nuclear power plants. We have no choice but to look this problem squarely in the face. With nuclear energy and its challenges, besides needing to figure out what to do with all the radioactive waste from power plants, there are plenty of other critical questions, especially since the Fukushima disaster in Japan. We will take a look at the things that happened in Fukushima Daiichi and see if there aren't some lessons we can learn.